I'm here today to talk to you guys about, and if you leave anywhere after this talk, I just want you to think about one thing, which is how do you use information? How do you generate information? And what's happening to that information? Because this talk is about humans as information hunter-gatherers. A bit of background. This has been a journey that I've been on since 2008. It was a six-year study at this time where we looked at how people form experiences, how they, how they perceive environments, and how then resultant behaviours affect how they uh, develop the environments, design the environments, and also a big narrative on human health and what it does to us psycho psychologically. We compared visual perception and emotion and behavior in real environments and in virtual environments. We'll talk more about this, but I want to jump back a bit and just look at how important and how pivotal what came before was. The journey that we've been on through human origins, varied, varied landscapes, and developing ourselves with regards to emotion and behavior. Humans are an incredibly adaptive species. We have existed in savanna biomes. We've dwelled in caves, in woodland. The one thing that I don't think we're quite prepared for is existing in an information-rich, dense landscape that we are in today. How do we deal with this? How do we deal with this influx, this constant bombardment of data, of information? What do we do with it? So, the environments we exist in today are much more complex. The city, over 55% of the global population live in cities. By 2050, 68% will. At the moment, there are 21 megacities in the world. By 2030, which is not long away, there will be 43 megacities. A megacity is a city that has over 10 million inhabitants. Now play it forward slightly in your mind. What ramifications does this have on food production, on transport, on energy consumption? So we are producing and consuming more data by the billions of data points and harvesting information from our environments every day. But what are we doing with it? Is it just another picture of my breakfast going up on Instagram? Is it another tweet, another post? Am I spending all this information, all this energy, posting and following people? So I want us to think very carefully about using that information so that we can apply it to a better future, to a better environment, and to create a better society. Now on the next slide, we're gonna talk a little bit about innate human responses. And these, respon these are responses that are emotional responses and behavioral responses that you can't control. So I want you to put your hand up if you feel anything on the next slide. Anybody, there you go. <laughs> and in this slide, it's a really good example of how we, as a, as a race, have evolved to focus on a few things, such as protection, territoriality, notions of prospect and refuge, safety, security, survival, and learning. I won't dwell on the next slide too long, he says, because it's pretty horrible. I can't, can't do it. Straight back onto something incredibly cute. This slide here. Our environment, our modern day environment, since the 1800s, we have, uh, in 1800s, there was 3% of people that lived in cities in the world. And over the last 218 years, we have gradually learned behaviors, and there's a guy called Roger Barker who came up with a theory around behavior settings and behavioral scripts that was a learning mechanism of how we, how we behave in certain types of space. So when we go to a coffee shop, we stand in line, we order at the counter, we go to the end of the counter, we pick our drink up, we go sit down. It's very different from when we go to a restaurant. We go in, we wait to be seated, we're seated, we then get our food brought to us. Again, very different from the typology of a library, the environment. These are all learned behaviors, but they're from cues, informational cues in the environment that we learn from an incredibly young age. Now, the work that we've done linking emotion and behavior together and looking at 
what that looks like as a whole from that study is here. This is a circumplex model of emotion that we developed during our studies. Prior to this, there was a, a model of, of general emotion that combined 19, 19 studies of emotion theory and evolutionary theory. The emotions around the outsider here are individual emotions that are related to core emotions and they fall into two main groups. One is positive states, one is negative states. Now you've got happiness, you've got fear on both sides. The negative states are underpinned by a lack of ability to cope. Okay? They are underpinned by a loss of information that would enable you to achieve a goal or a loss of resource that would enable you to achieve a goal. The positive states are underpinned by an ability to cope. They're underpinned by acquiring or the acquisition of information that enables you to cope or enables you to achieve goals. There's also social interaction that improves your ability to cope. And they all exist, but there's three main themes here. One of them is survival. And Jay Appleton, a British geographer, came up with the theory of prospect and refuge. Prospect is about opportunity, refuge is about safety. And part of this, Jay Appleton said, was that environmental information is acquired, stored, and efficiently retrieved to avoid threats and increase survival. And the psychiatrist and cyberneticist Ross Ashby also said that the, func the whole function of the brain is summed up in error correction. Everything that goes on in here is about learning. And that is all taken from cues and information in the environment. Now, if we're spending 40 hours a week looking at our phones, what are we learning? What are we taking in from the environment around us? The second mechanism is, the second key theme is the ability to cope. And this is a big one. And Richard Lazarus had a theory called appraisal theory. And this was def defined emotions in relation to their relevance to goal conduciveness. And a key aspect of this, again, was the individual's ability to cope or the coping potential of that individual. And evolutionary psychologist David Geary said that core intelligence is the ability to anticipate and predict variation and novelty and to devise strategies to cope. So coping and survival are two key themes here. This is a big one. We exist in information landscapes. Kaplan and Kaplan in the 80s pointed this out. We exist in information landscapes. We are information seekers. We are humans, natural information hunter gatherers. This is how we survive. This is how we adapt to changing environments. Neurobiologists have found specific areas of the brain that are related to reward and threat values. This is ingrained in us. But are we hunting and gathering aimlessly? What are we applying this energy to? It all takes metabolic energy to search this information, to acquire things, to do things with it. Most, of, most information is going on Twitter posts, Instagram posts, social media posts. How are we using the information in our environment at the moment? There was a great chap called Edward Wilson who developed a fantastic theory called biophilia hypothesis. This was about our humans' innate interaction with nature and how that nature and natural scenes, we lived in nature long before we lived in the city. 200 years in the city, a bit longer, a couple of million in nature. Wilson said that we are drowning in information while starving for wisdom. The world henceforth, as he put it, will be run by synthesizers. These are people who are able to put together and pull together the right information at the right point in time and think critically about it and make important choices wisely. Have we lost our way somewhere in this process? Do we still have that ability? Great presentation earlier about climate change and complacency. 
we may have lost our way, just a little. Is it now more about short-term, egocentric achievement of goals? Do we still consider collective achievements or collective movements? Is it about seeking momentary, instantaneous gratification? Are we sleepwalking like zombies into a future where we are the information? It messes with my head a bit. Are we the commodity here? Because it feels like that sometimes. Instead of actually utilizing this information and this information rich landscape to safeguard our future and to create a healthier society and a healthier environment. We are at the dawn of the Anthropocene. This is the next geological era. This is the era, the change in eras, where the greatest impact on the environment, on geology, and on ecosystems and trophic structures, we as humans have had the greatest impact. And every time we see this, and every time we present this, people are shocked. Oh, this is unbelievable. Yet, we've all heard these figures, we've all heard of this happening for years. How are we harnessing this information as a society, as, as a collective? What are we doing about it as individuals? In design and architecture, and when we look at environments, there are so many bad environments out there. There are so many overcrowded workplaces with poor internal air quality, which is absolutely horrendous for your mental well-being. It's terrible for your physical well-being. Poor physical light conditions. Where I work at Ryder, we place a huge emphasis on people. You would think, well, that's obvious. But given these environments, not everybody does. We place a huge emphasis on healthy buildings and on trying to create a better world. Now, housing is a huge issue. This is Hong Kong, a city of 7.4 million people. Not quite a mega city. It has a housing problem with 200,000 people housed inadequately. And over 40,000 of those people are children. These are the coffin homes of Hong Kong. A coffin home is a 200 square foot apartment that is carved into 20 dwellings with a six foot by two foot, two and a half foot cage in which people sleep, live, eat, cook, clean, wash, defecate. And they pay 250 pounds a week for that pleasure. Is this our future? And given the rising global population and all of the issues that we've discussed, we are in a leadership vacuum with global governments not addressing this situation. So how are we going to utilize this wealth of information around us to make sure that this isn't our future? Where I work, we are looking at data in cities, we're looking at wearable data, we're looking at data in homes, we're looking at how can we use that data to predict energy consumption and make it accurate so that we can move towards a zero carbon future. We're looking at using building information modeling so that we can optimize facilities management, so that we can make things more efficient, so that we can again use less energy and move towards a zero carbon future. We have developed a platform with the BIM Academy called Smart Connected Buildings, which allows any form of data to plug into it and be visualized and compared. And it gives you actionable health and well-being advice to occupants. It will tell you that there's too much mold in your house. It will tell you that it's too warm, that the air is too dry. This is how we intelligently apply data. This is what Wilson meant by having people that can synthesize and be critical and apply that information. We're working on housing schemes, housing for the, housing for the future that is technology rich and information rich, that allows somebody to age throughout their entire life in one home. 
because why should you have to move? And we're also looking at modern methods of construction, flying factories, taking them to areas that need regenerating so that we can train the local community and that we can upskill people and raise employment levels and add real social value to a situation. So I'm going to end now, but I want you to really consider a few things. I want you to think about, are we information hunter-gatherers really? Or are we just the information? And is that right? I think and I believe that we are information hunter-gatherers. And we must use more information, more intelligently, for the greater good. And not just become that information. Everything, in my mind, is about human experience, it is about human behaviour, and that will dictate our whole future. We must decide how we want to live, and what kind of world we want to live in. And we must become more aware of the consequences of our actions and decisions. And this is all related to information, learning and action. And we must focus on improving societal and environmental health and move towards a zero waste and a zero carbon emissions future. Now, from here on out, I think that we need more collaboration. We need stronger leadership and we need to initiate change quickly. I think life will definitely find a way without a doubt, but the quality of that life will depend entirely on what we choose to value and what each of us individually and collectively choose to act upon. I'm Oliver Jones, thank you very much.